I know on the list of Christmas stories, you love to hear every year repeated again and again, the genealogy of Matthew is right up there at the top. I know each of you like to read that whole thing in your own homes every Christmas. So this Advent, we're embarking on a Christmas tour of homes, imagining what visiting the houses of the four gospel writers at Christmas might be like. And today we're invited into Matthew's home. Now unlike Mark's wilderness place last week, where there was no knowledge of Christmas, Matthew is all about Christmas. Christmas is like a giant family reunion at Matthew's house. People come from all over. Some are around the piano singing, I wonder as I wander. We Three Kings is a favorite at Matthew's house too. He has a tree with bright lights, and of course, there's a star on top. And Matthew goes all Tim the Toolman Taylor or Clark Griswold on the outside of his house. He's erected a 10-foot star on his roof that shines brighter than the Hershey Stadium lights. So you can easily find Matthew's place if you want to visit. The Magi have found it. They've actually just arrived, and it's, it's actually a little bit odd that the Magi come. These kings or astrologer or wise ones, whoever they are, they have shown up as something of party crashers at Matthew's family Christmas. Because all of Joseph's family is gathered, and I mean all of them. Over by the tree in some easy chairs, you will find Abraham. You know Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. Now Abraham's like my grandpa DeVo and can nap anywhere, so he's napping over there. He's Joseph's great-great, 40 generations great-grandfather. And next to him, playing what child is this on the lyre is King David. It just, it just wouldn't be Christmas at Matthew's house without all these people. That's why they are front and center in Matthew's gospel. Chapter 1, right there at the beginning. You have to pass through them to get to the rest of the story. And here they are gathered on the lawn and the porch and in the hallways, generations of them. Isaac, Jacob, Solomon, and so many, you have to pass through them to get into Matthew's house. Now, we shouldn't be shocked that they've all shown up, but it may surprise you to know, to remember, that Christmas at Matthew's house is a Jewish celebration. Remember, Christmas is the celebration of the birth of the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, the promised one. In Judaism. Matthew is Jewish and so much of his gospel, he wants to make sure people know that this is a continuation. That's why he so often connects everything back to Hebrew scriptures. This was done to fulfill what was written by Isaiah, by the prophet. Again and again, he wants to connect Jesus to the Hebrew scriptures. So all the people at Matthew's house are Jewish, except the Magi. They are Gentiles, and they've, they've crashed this family reunion, and, but they were invited, so they aren't really crashers at all. It's a bit confusing. Why are they invited? Why did Matthew send directions? Why would they come so far for this Jewish celebration? I think to answer those questions, we can start where Matthew starts, with Jesus' family tree. Have you ever done a family tree have you ever really looked back at all the old stories in your family tree? I'm sure everybody in all your family trees are absolutely perfect and shining examples of humanity, right? You're laughing. So we start with Jesus' family tree. Abraham was the father of Isaac. You remember them, Abraham and Sarah, barren for decades until Isaac was born. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Maybe you remember that story. Jacob, the trickster, hoodwinking Isaac's blessing from his older brother. It's more Jacob's story than Esau's, and that continues at Matthew's house. Matthew doesn't mention Uncle Esau at all. So once again, Jacob, the baby brother, gets all the attention. Some of you know what that's like, I hear, back there. It goes on generation after generation. Jesse was the father of King David, the shepherd boy, the giant slayer who becomes king. With every name, there is a story. But not every story is good or comfortable. The stories go all the way to Matthew, who was the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, and Joseph the father of... It gets a bit awkward here. Joseph the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born. Did this ever confuse you? 
Does this ever confuse you? Because it sure confused me. Because it's clear that Matthew has marched through the generations to show Jesus' link to Jewish royalty, to King David. Go so far, if you want to have an extra little fun bit of trivia, David's numerical value, the numerical value of his name in kind of Hebrew numerology is 14. The three letters of his name, basically the D, the V, and the D, they had no vowels, comes to 14, 6, 4, and 6. And so you have 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. He's trying so hard to show how Jesus comes in the line of David. But when it gets to the last link in this chain, Joseph turns out not to be the kid's father in some kind of Jerry Springer shocking revelation at the end of this big, long family tree presentation. You're kind of like, well, why did we just go through all this then? No, see, Joseph is the guy who marries the mother of the Emmanuel child. Joseph is the main character in Matthew's Christmas story. There's a chair reserved for him around Matthew's dining room table. But he is not the father of Jesus, at least biologically. But after 40 generations of the father of, to be the husband of, well, it's kind of, it's a bit messy, a bit complicated. But life's like that, isn't it? If God is going to come down and live a life like us, it might as well start off a bit messy and complicated. Because nothing's perfect. When is life perfect? When I was a kid, I used, we used to go to the Christmas tree farm and cut down our own tree. Anybody ever cut down their own Christmas tree? In theory, that's really nice. But it always had problems. It was either too tall, we'd bring it in and we'd scrape the paint on the ceiling of the living room. Or it wouldn't fit in the base. There were too many trees too low, so you have to try to chop or saw them all off. But then the trunk isn't quite long enough, so you have to try to get some small boards to prop up and wedge underneath it. And then no tree's perfect on all sides, so you have to pick which side's going to face the corner of the room. That's why you put a tree in the corner. Every tree has its share of issues. Natural life is like that. Do you know anyone without any issues? Now, we try to hide our issues and our problems. It's like turning the bad side to the corner, only posting that seemingly picture-perfect memory on Facebook. Once we get that nice picture, that one corner of our house is perfect for Christmas when everything else is a mess, we post that one. How often do you see pictures of the mess on social media? We hide it. We sweep it under the rug. We turn it to the corner. We leave those pictures out. It's like at a family wedding when you put all the troubled family members at one table in the corner of the room. We all do it. No family tree is perfect. We all have our share of issues. Maybe that one uncle we'd like to put in the corner. But when it comes to the family tree of Jesus, we might expect if there were some problem spots, this is a big gospel of good news, that they'd be hidden, turned to the corner. Let's kind of shade that part over. Let's gild it over. Let's not reveal the shadow side. But no. Matthew brings the messy parts right out in the open. It turns out that Jesus' family is as messy and complicated as most. Is your family a bit messy? Can dynamics be a bit challenging? Relationships strained? People haven't all led perfect lives? We often uncover the shadow side of our families if we dig too deep. So many of us choose not to. We tend to go with the artificial tree for Christmas and with family, when we can design ourselves to look good for the world. But real trees and real people have problems. You know that. Matthew knows that. A closer read of Jesus' family tree reveals more than a few branches that would raise an eyebrow or two in ancient Israel. There are five women to start with. Ancient genealogies were all men, the father of, the father of, the father of, because they believed that women were merely vessels for the baby without contributing anything to the life inside them, so they contributed nothing to the baby of personality, of health, of anything, why name them? They were just the vessels. That's what they believed. 
So reading Jesus' family tree is like opening a 1939 yearbook from the Citadel or some other male, all-male institution and finding cadets named Lucy, Susan, and Cindy. It says, Judah was the father of Perez by Tamar. Now, Tamar was a brave woman in her own right, but Tamar was a Canaanite. She also had to pretend to be a prostitute in order to have Perez by Judah because Judah wasn't living up to his duty and obligation to take care of Tamar after she was widowed twice by Judah's sons. It's kind of a weird and messy story. If you get forward, flip to Genesis 38 this afternoon and read it. It's not a shining moment for a lot of reasons in the story of Jesus' family. And yet Tamar the Canaanite is mentioned. Now, this is the family tree of the Jewish Messiah. Why would Matthew want us to know that Jesus has a Gentile in his family tree, especially one that was from a group of people, the Canaanites, that the Israelites went to war with and basically wiped out, and one whose story is so messy? And not just one. Rahab was as well. And then there was Ruth, who was a Moabite woman whose story is similar in that Ruth's also being widowed and obligations to her are not being met by the men in her family. But Ruth is here at Matthew's house too. Ruth the Moabite. There was no love for Moabites in Israel. Deuteronomy says not even their descendants to the tenth generation can be welcomed into the assembly of the people, into the family of God. Not even to the tenth generation of Ruth's grandson should be in the family of God. And there within that ten, well, there's King David. Hmm. Yet Ruth is there at the family reunion when it clearly says she shouldn't be. What do you think that's about? And then Rahab, the prostitute's there. That's awkward. And yet there she is, strong, a survivor, doing whatever she could to survive and provide and hope for a better life. Maybe there's something noble in that. At least Matthew thinks so. See, Matthew's revealing all the imperfections. He even goes after King David, the most revered member of the family. Matthew shares that David was the father of Solomon. Solomon was the king who built the temple, the man of wisdom. But Matthew shares an interesting little detail he slides in there. David, the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. Uriah's wife's name was Bathsheba. Of all the women mentioned, she's the only one who doesn't get her name said. That's often the case. The women who are victims often aren't remembered. So let's remember her name together. Her name was Bathsheba. David sexually assaulted Bathsheba and then tried to have Uriah, her husband, killed in battle. Nobody wants to bring this up ever, but Matthew does. It's weird, isn't it? Why is he doing this? It turns out that Jesus' family, like most families, is messy and complicated, and I kind of like that. It means Jesus gets me in my family, in the legacies and the wounds passed down from generation to generation. Every family is messy. I'm willing to bet yours is too. That's life. And that's Christmas at Matthew's house. Everyone is there despite the mistakes and the messiness and the awkwardness. There's still a place for everyone at Matthew's house. There's more than one woman who is, there's one more woman who is a surprise in Jesus' family tree. And that's Mary. She's engaged to Joseph, who is in King David's line. Mary must be of someone's line, but we don't know who, at least not at Matthew's house. We know over 40 generations of Joseph's family, but Mary just drops out of nowhere. She could be anybody, which I think is the point. In Matthew's house and in God's world, Anybody can make a difference. Anybody can be a hero. Anybody can be used by God to turn the world around. And anyone is welcome at Matthew's house this Christmas, no matter your history or your backstory. See, I think Derry takes his cue from Matthew. Anyone is welcome here. 
no matter your family, your history, your backstory, you can bring your messiness, your mistakes here. You're welcome. Well, you know the story. Mary gives birth to Jesus, Emmanuel, and Joseph adopts him. But I think it's more than that. So much more. What I think Joseph hears from the angel is, listen, Joseph, this isn't just about you welcoming a child into your family. It's you who have been adopted. In and through this baby, you and your family, stretching all the way back, all those 40 generations to Abraham, have been adopted by God as sons and daughters, children of God. And because Joseph's family is as messy as it is, with men who shirk their duties and women women who will do what it takes, with prostitutes and assault victims and assaulters, Canaanites and Moabites, it's clear that the Jewish Messiah has come to adopt not simply the Jewish family, but the human family. All of us, in all our complicatedness and messiness. Which is, of course, why these magi are at Matthew's house for a family Christmas. Matthew invites all the messy family into his house, and then invites anyone and everyone else to bring their mess including us. We are welcome into the family of God despite our faults and our issues, and so is everyone else. We are not to be the gatekeepers of who gets to come in. Now, you, you should have received your invitation by now. Have you turned in your RSVP card? I always forget to do that. You don't have to bring anything but yourself. Don't bring deviled eggs or any of that. Just bring yourself. But you are welcome to bring your baggage any baggage you may have to Matthew's house. So I hope you'll stop by this Christmas. The star will light the way. And if you spend a day at Matthew's house, you will hear this clear invitation. Let us no longer be defined by our hurt, but by our hope. Let us no longer be defined by our race or our station or our nation, but by the one who has claimed us and adopted us into the story of immeasurable hope, of everlasting love. We will no longer be defined by the messiness in our lives, but by the one who writes our names onto the branches of the family tree of the Emmanuel child. Imagine that. At least try to imagine that. And come spend some time at Matthew's house because you and everyone else is welcome there. So come sit by David or Jacob or Tamar or Rahab or Joseph or Mary. Come sit by other imperfect folk whom God loves and redeems and uses for a glorious purpose. There's a place for you. I hope you believe that and I hope you know that. Because I think it goes back to that big question I always struggled with early on. Why is Joseph named? Why is it his family? There's a lot of answers to that question. Part of it is Matthew wants to connect Jesus to Judaism. What's more is I think it shows Joseph adopted Jesus into that family. And that's enough. And God adopts us into God's family. And that's enough. And no messiness on your part, no mistakes, no history, no backstory, no my ancestors were this or did this, I said this when I was this, I did this when I was that age. None of that matters. God's never going to cancel you. God says, you are my beloved. There's a place for you in my family. And my family sticks together no matter the mess. Nothing you can do will separate you from God's love. So I hope you'll come to have a family Christmas at Matthew's house. It's a place with your name on it. You just got to show up. Let us pray together. Mighty God, thank you that your love for us never ends, that you call us as deep calls to deep despite the mess, the mistakes, despite anything in our lives or in our past, you adopt us as your children, and you will love us and welcome us forever.
help us to reflect that same love and that welcome to your family across the whole world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.